Hey guys, Sam here. Welcome to part two of the Precision Rifle Load Development video series. If you missed the first one, it was all about working with new brass for my new competition rifle. This video is going to cover bullet selection as well as where we're going to start with our seating depth. Alright, let's back up a step and uh, address a couple of questions that I got from the first video. Uh, one of them was, do I do anything at all with the primer pockets on the brass? You know, I have a tool. And it's this cool little double end deal. One has a large rifle and one has a small rifle cutter in them and they're adjustable. But I don't remember the brand of this. It doesn't have any markings on it and I haven't been able to find one like it online to even give you a recommendation. But the whole reason I bought this tool is I had some Remington uh, 300 uh, Ultra Mag Brass I was using in a 338 Edge. Well the primer pockets, primer pockets and brass have a SAMI spec. So they're spec to be a certain depth from the case head. Well, in this brass, when I was seating primers, a couple of different brands of primers, they weren't seating flush with the case head. So when I'd seat them to the stop, they would be protruding over the case head, even brand new ones. So I needed a way to cut those down so that I could get the primer to sit flush, at least with the case head. Because when I closed the bolt, the bolt was actually dragging over that primer. So, you know, that's no good. So I bought this tool to cut those pockets down to spec. Well, I haven't had to cut any other pockets since then to get the primers to sit flush. What I use it for now is to clean out brass. So it makes a really cool way to clean the carbon out of the brass, and at the same time, it puts a perfectly flat uh, seating surface for the primer down the bottom of that pocket. But if I run it over this uh, Lapua brass, there's hardly any action at all. It's just barely swiping right at the flash hole. So uh, with Lapua brass, I don't worry about it, but I use it to clean the pockets out and it just cuts carbon right out and you can just see shiny brass there because you will get some brass flow back into that pocket after you fire the cases a little bit. So anyway, there's one of the questions. Another question was, is there any other 260 Remington brass on the market that I would recommend? Well, I'll tell you, there are a couple of them that look promising. One of them is Alpha. Alpha Munitions makes some top-notch looking brass. I was actually going to use some of it on this project, but the extractor groove in this surgeon bolt, the extractor that comes with it, is uh, the groove itself is a little too small to accept alpha brass. So the alpha extractor rim is pretty thick compared to Lapua and any other brand I've seen. So uh, I filed it down a little bit, but I stopped after the second time. And I thought, you know what, I'm just going to run it as is because I have 300 pieces of Lapua up on the shelf. It's nice looking brass though. I'd really like to try Alpha in one of my projects. Uh, another one is Peterson. I haven't seen it in person yet, but other people have told me it's pretty nice. And yet another is Starline. Starline is a really good, at least in my experience, a really good pistol brass manufacturer. And they've kind of branched out into making a lot of brass for all these different rifle cartridges. So uh, the price looks pretty good on them. I think they're running 50 to 60 cents a piece but you have to buy it in 250 piece lots so I didn't pick any up anyway that's that's the deal I think there's probably some good brass on the market right now that I just haven't had the opportunity to try so uh, maybe later on down the road in this project I'll try a couple of those alright let's talk about the criteria for me picking a bullet that I'm gonna shoot in my rifle number one and the most important one is it has to shoot well in other words it has to give us that half inch requirement and low ES and be consistent for me to even think about using it in the gun. I'm not sponsored by any bullet companies. Uh, I'm not afraid to try any one of these bullets here. They're all good match bullets I think. But the number one priority is it has to shoot well on the gun. So if you're trying to pick a bullet to shoot in your rifle and you get all these guys posting on Facebook about the latest greatest 6.5 bullet out there and and it's just a laser and it's slick and it's got the best BC and it's just a, a freaking laser beam in my rifle and it doesn't shoot well in yours, don't worry about it. It happens to everybody. Uh, you know, sponsored shooters, are that's what they're there for. They're to push bullets for the company that sends them the bullets. So uh, if it doesn't shoot well in your rifle, don't worry about it. Move on to the next one. So that's the number one priority, number one criteria for using a bullet in this match rifle. Number two, it has to be available. I don't want a bullet that's some kind of a, a unicorn, you know. This is so good and all these guys have it, except there aren't enough bullets out there for everybody. So I want a bullet that I can go buy a thousand of them whenever I want. That's number two. Number three, we're going to look at ballistic coefficient, 
but it's not the number one priority. BC, while it's important and you can use it to your advantage, doesn't do you any good if the bullet doesn't shoot well in the barrel and you can't move it fast enough to overcome the other bullet with the lower BC. So it's always going to be a trade-off. So the second part of number three is velocity. How fast can I get the bullet going and can I keep my ES numbers low while I'm getting up to max speed? So if you look at all these bullets, you know, we have a, what three different weights here. We have 130, 140, 147. You might be able to push the 130s, or I might be able to push these 130s, either one of them, either the, the Hornady ELD match or the Burger Hybrid. I might be able to push those fast enough and well enough while I'm doing it to overcome any BC advantage from all the other bullets running at their max speed. So uh, for match shooting, we aren't trying to kill animals. We don't need you know a lot of lead to, to get in there and make stuff bleed. We're just trying to hit a plate. So how do I pick which one of these bullets I'm going to use? Uh, I'll tell you right now what I'm going to do. I'm going to start with 130s. Uh, I have a lot of experience shooting the 130 hybrids, the Burger 130 hybrids. I've shot thousands of them, so I'm going to start with the 130 class, uh, both the 130 hybrid as well as the 130 ELDM from Hornady. Now that Hornady bullet, we shot that this last year out of my Savage, that LRP. It is scary accurate. Awesome little bullet. And we shot, we were shooting ground squirrels six, seven, eight hundred yards with that bullet out of that rifle. So uh, all I did was I took my load from my hybrid that I already had for the Savage and loaded up those ELDMs and started shooting them and it was just beautiful. We shot a couple of deer with it too and an antelope but uh, anyway that will be covered later on down the road. So I'm going to start with 130 class. If I can get a hold of some Nosler RDFs, their brand new 130s, I might try those too. But what I'm going to do first is I'm going to start with one weight class of bullet and see how they perform. See if I get to my half inch right away, see what my velocity looks like, and come up with a baseline, you know, some kind of a, a starting point to see uh, what the barrel likes. So the 130s will come first, and then depending on what kind of mood I'm in, I might just stop at the 130s and that's what I'm going to shoot. Alright, so what's the first thing I'm going to do when I figure out which one of these bullets, which is going to be one of the 130s, uh, what's the first thing I'm going to do before I start loading them up? I need to figure out what my max cartridge base to ogive length is in the barrel. So from the, the bolt face to the lands of the bullet, I need to know what that dimension is so that I can uh, set up my seating depth to how I want to start. Uh, the way I always like doing that is by using this overall length gauge. Uh, I've gone over this before. There's a video on YouTube as well as an article on the website that talks all about uh, measuring bullet depth and or seating depth and, and where to start and all that. But we're going to go back over it in this video series. So the first thing I need to do is make a modified case for this chamber. Now, I function tested this rifle as soon as I got done chambering it. And as soon as the, the bedding cured in the stock, I took it out and just pointed it into a snowbank and fired two rounds. Then I loaded it Sammy spec, Sammy length, just to get the cases so that I can make a modified case. I made one already, and I'm going to make one for you today on video. So anyway, let's head out to the shop, and I'll show you how I do that. Okay, now I have a fired case out of the new 260 barrel. I'm going to use this to make my modified case. Now the modified case is going to end up screwing into the end of this overall length gauge and give me a way to check uh, seating depth in my barrel. So what I'm going to end up with is a threaded case that I'm going to drill and tap on my lathe. Uh, the other part of this is I'm going to try to make this case fit the chamber exactly how all of my cases are going to fit it. So in other words, uh, what I'm going to end up with is as close to a uh, representation of what's actually going to be in the chamber. So what I did was I fired it number one and then I ran it through a body die only and sized the body dimensions exactly how they're going to be uh, when I size all my brass. And at the end of that, I made sure I had two thousandths of shoulder bump on it. So basically, this case is exactly what I would feed back through the rifle. The only exception is, is I didn't touch the neck. You need the neck to be expanded, and uh, you want the bullet that you're going to put in this to measure your seating depth with to move freely inside the neck. So I'll show you how to clean all that up. The drill bit is a letter L drill bit. Now, I don't know if there's a different size that's close to that that'll work. All I know is that letter L works just fine. The tap 
is a 5 sixteenths by 36. It is fine and it is tiny, but it works very well. So we have our hole drilled now. You can see how thick a cartridge head brass is. A lot of metal there. So the next thing we're going to do is put our tap in. All right, there's our threads, uh, 5 sixteenths by 36 and it allowed me to screw in the overall length gauge just like that so now that'll take the place of a cartridge head and what it does is it lets you put the the flat of your caliper jaw right across this to measure off the heck the case head and then the plastic piece inside pushes the bullet in and out the gray piece that you can see in there all right the next step is to uh, check our fit check the case make sure it goes in and what I'm after here is I want that case to slide all the way into the chamber and seat on the shoulder I don't want it getting hung up back here on the web or something like that I want it to I want to actually feel it seat all the way against the shoulder just like you would with a case that you're chambering so I'll slide it in the chamber here and there's no resistance and I can feel it bang up against the shoulder of the chamber so I know I'm good there next thing we want to do is check the fit of the bullet so I'm going to use this uh, Hornady uh, 143 grain ELDX slide it into the neck and it slides okay. I haven't done anything at all to the neck yet. This is just a fired case. You can see how it slides in. And then our rod, it bottoms out against the rod. And then the rod will push the bullet back up. But what you don't want is a bunch of resistance in here. You want that to slide very easily so you can tell when you're at the right at the rifling. You don't want to be forcing it at any point because you're going to end up forcing it all the way into the rifling. There isn't a whole lot of... Uh, uh, mechanical action on this rod. It just flexes too much to rely on feeling it go through the neck. So I'm going to open that neck up just a little bit. Okay, to open up the neck a little bit, I just take a piece of brass rod or you know anything you have that'll hold a piece of emery cloth round and get it into the end of that neck. And just take a little bit off the neck, clean it up, make it smooth. You don't need to hog it out, you just want the bullet to slide very easily when you're pushing it with the overall length gauge. So now it's nice and shiny. Let's see what we get. Yeah, that's where I want to be. So this bullet moves in and out of the case very easily. Nothing's going to hang up on that. Okay, before we start playing with our modified case, let's talk about some basic measuring tools that I think you should own. Uh, number one is the caliper. You either need a good mechanical caliper or a good electronic one. This is the 6-inch Mitoyo, Mitotoyo uh, electronic caliper. I've had this for years. I've used it a lot and never had a problem with it. It's uh, easy to read. If you don't like using the dials, it's all the digital readout. You know, it's very easy to read. but. Uh, I recommend you get a good pair of calipers. The other thing you're going to need is a comparator body and an insert. The insert is going to be sized to the bullet caliber. So this one is a 2.6 marked on it. It comes from Sinclair. It's made out of stainless steel. Hornady sells a kit and I think you can buy the individual inserts as well but they're aluminum. I prefer the stainless steel. It seems to be a little more consistent uh, and I, it's hard to hurt it. You can't ding it by accident. It's just been really good for me. So the comparator body, you can buy those from Sinclair, and the comparator body is identical to the Hornady one. The only difference is the color. So if you already have a Hornady kit and you want to add to 
your capabilities so that you can measure bearing surface on bullets. So you have two comparators, two comparator bodies. I recommend the Sinclair ones. I really like them. All they do is they clamp onto your caliper's jaw. You turn it on, you zero it out. So now it's a, a zero reference from here to the other side. We're going to use that to do all of our uh, seating depth measurements, all of our throat measurements. Everything having to do with bullet depth is going to happen with this comparator and bullet insert. Now one thing I will caution you on is that these uh, inserts are all just a little bit different as far as the, you know, the machining uh, specs and tolerances and whatever else you want to call it. The way they're made, they're all just a little bit different. So I suggest that you pick one for doing all of your seating depth measurements on your rifle when you're reloading. And if you want to get another one to check bearing surfaces or whatever, mark it, put it away somewhere, and you know, make sure you have some way of knowing which one is which. Otherwise, you're going to you know, take a, an insert from Hornady and slap it in this thing and do your uh, seating depth measurements, and then you're going to go to replicate that load six months from now, and you can use a different insert, and your seating depth is going to be all over the place. And I've seen some pretty big differences between them on inserts that are marked exactly the same. So just keep it in mind. All of this stuff is relative. Use the same tools, use the same methods, use everything the same every time, and you won't have to worry about it. All right, let's go ahead and take our measurement now. This is going to be our starting point. We're going to figure out uh, what our max cartridge base to ogive length can be. And this will be the baseline for our throat measurement. So we're going to write this down. Uh, we're going to keep it in a safe place, and we're going to use it to keep track of how our barrel is wearing as far as throat. So the case is seated, the shoulder's against the shoulder of the chamber. I'm going to loosen the lock nut. I'm going to push that in until I just feel resistance at the lands. And then I'm going to hold tension on it and tighten the lock screw back up. And pull the modified case out. Now the bullet almost always sticks to the rifling. So I'm just going to turn this upside down and let her fall out. Okay, so then we take the bullet. We put it back in the modified case and seat it against the end of the rod. So this is what a loaded case can look like when it touches the lands with this bullet. So this is going to be our max length right here. So let's take a reading. Caliper. It's like a 2.066. So what I like to do is I like to write these down and take three or four measurements. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and take a second measurement. See how consistent I am. Seat it to the shoulder. Loosen the lock screw. Touch the lands. Tighten the lock screw again. So that time the bullet didn't stay in there, so I didn't have as much pressure on it. Let's see if her number matches up. Okay, it's within uh, five ten thousandths of the first one, so <laughs> that's pretty good. I'm just going to stop there. That's pretty good average, so I have 2.066 on the first one. 2.0665 on the second one. Uh, and that amount isn't going to make any difference whatsoever. So I know my baseline, my baseline for my starting point and my baseline for my throat wear and everything with this comparator, this modified case is going to be 2.066. So everything is going to be based off of that. Okay, so we have our modified case all made for this chamber. It's uh, perfect. It's two thousandths off the shoulder, bumped. It's got exactly the same dimensions that my once fired brass is going to have when I run it through my sizing die. It's all good. Now let me throw a wrench into the gears. If you use a generic case, it's not going to match what that fired case is when you go to load all this up later. If you get lucky, 
Say I use this generic case from Hornady. This was a modified case that I bought when I first started shooting 260. They made this with Remington brass. So if I was firing a brand new Remington brass, virgin brass had never been fired before, using this modified case and the dimensions were all identical, then I would have an accurate seating depth for that brass at that time. Once I fired the brass, if it stretched at all, it's not going to be accurate anymore. Simply because we're changing, we're not changing the shoulder to the lands. That's a mechanical thing inside the chamber. All that's going to stay the same. But we are changing from the shoulder back to the case head. So when we go to measure that the next time, it's going to be uh, longer. So we're, if, we're, if we try to get the same seating depth as we did with the new case, we're actually going to be jumping further if the, if the fire case is stretched at all because we're looking for the same number except this dimension from the shoulder of the case head has grown on a fired case. It might not be much, five thousands, six thousands, ten thousands, and you can't really tell, you can't really say, I know I stretched ten thousands so I'm going to uh, apply that to my seating depth because the shoulder angle can change a little bit and the way you measure things are always a little bit different. I guess the, big, the main point is, is all of this stuff is a reference. Unless you're using that perfectly shaped modified case in your chamber, all of this is just a reference. It's just a reference for me when I'm going to go run this new brass through the gun because the new brass is shorter than that fired case. So I'm going to run at least 15 thousandths off the lands with my first firing that will probably put me closer to 20 thousandths off the lands and uh, I'm going to adjust from there. But once I get into my first fired brass stage on this rifle, this is going to give me a perfectly accurate, precise way of measuring my throat and adjusting my seating depth. Alright guys, I hope that last part was clear enough. Uh, sometimes I think ignorance is bliss and I wish I never would have realized that those dimensions were that different. The first time I picked up on that I was uh, reloading for, I was actually trying to test a 338 edge plus P for Sean Carlock and I realized that my seating depths were uh, not consistent from new brass to fired brass and uh, it, it dawned on me that the, the dimensions of a new piece of brass versus a fired piece of brass were completely different and when we make those modified cases we don't use new brass we fire it in the chamber because that's what we want you know we're going to use it however many times down the road with all this fired brass so anyway it's a reference number just think about it and Maybe an easier way to understand it is to draw it out and look at it the way the case stretches. But anyway, I've decided that I'm going to start with 130s on the match rifle. I'm probably going to seat them 15 to 20 thousandths off uh, because I'm using new brass instead of that fired brass. And I'm going to see where that gets me. So on our next video, we're going to start talking about picking a powder and picking a starting point for our powder charge. We're also going to talk about primers and... Uh, you know how to go about picking the right primer for it and uh, hopefully I'm going to load up a bunch of rounds and we're actually going to start shooting this gun but uh, until then thanks for watching and we'll see you next time